Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? My guest today is Professor Steve Keen. Steve is a distinguished research fellow at University College London and one of the few economists to correctly and publicly anticipate the global financial crisis of 2008, as well as the subsequent deflationary forces that would frustrate and confound policymakers in the years afterwards. He is also the author of Debunking Economics, The Naked Emperor Dethroned, as well as his more recent book titled, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? Steve and I have known each other going back almost 10 years now. He was a frequent guest on my old television program, Capital Account, and over those years, he really helped me gain a more complete picture of the monetary system and how money is actually created, which I think is so counterintuitive that I think for most people, it takes some time for it to really sink in. And I think if you want to challenge your understanding, especially if you're wedded to an Austrian theory of money and credit, as I was for so many years, Dr. Keene's work can really help to stimulate your curiosity because it draws from so many different perspectives. And also because Steve is a gadfly of sorts in the economics community. He likes to find these areas where he feels that thinking has stagnated or become conventional or where the consensus has gotten it wrong and go in there and stir things up. And we stir things up today for sure, but it's also a jovial conversation because, again, we've known each other for so long, and also because I only found out Steve would be in town a few days before this recording, and so I didn't have time to create a rundown. So this conversation is not structured in the way that most of my conversations are, but it is no less engaging and interesting because Steve has been spending more and more of his time lately on the economics of climate change which is something we haven't really talked about on this show. It's something we spent a lot of time on today, including a host of other topics, many of which we get into in the overtime, which goes on for an additional 40 minutes or so. Also, for anyone interested, Steve has a Patreon page where he posts a ton of educational material, including podcasts, video blogs, eBooks, you name it. So make sure to check that out. It's at patreon.com slash Prof. Steve Keen. So, without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Professor Steve Keen. Dr. Steve Keen, welcome to Hidden Forces. Good to be here, mate. Good to be uh, with you in a, a different venue to our previous life as interviewer or an interviewee. For sure. Well, I wasn't the interviewer in the previous life. You might as well have been. <laughs> I drove the agenda. You did drive the agenda. Oh my God. And what an agenda it was. We were just talking about that outside in the Mm. green room. Mm. There was definitely an agenda. Every morning with Capital Account, we would have show meetings. Everything had to fit within a particular angle. Mm -hmm. How does this reinforce the fact that central banks are bad, governments are bad, the markets are good, (laughs) you know, and you get boxed into it. It wasn't like something that I came up with disingenuously. I got boxed into an ideology that no longer really fit. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you a formula, but a formula that can lead you astray as well as give you a structure. Yeah, it's kind of one of the problems with a lot of the way that media is done today. It doesn't offer the opportunity to grow because growing means breaking with your stated beliefs, 
and those beliefs also are what the audience has come to expect. Mm. They're coming to you for validation, yeah, yeah. that their views of the world are correct. And if you give them something else, they feel betrayed. Sometimes. I mean, it's most media is like that these days, and it makes it very frustrating to work with it. Mm. I had that happen with, and it shouldn't have happened because I, I don't know, you know, I'm not really sure what sort of the general audience listener of this show thinks, but I, I did an episode with Andrew Morantz, who is a lefty. Yeah, He's a staff okay. writer for the New Yorker. You know what I mean? That makes him a lefty. Okay. Well, New Yorker is a, a lefty magazine okay. in New okay. York. And he grew up in Park Slope, Brooklyn, you know, and he wrote a book on online troll culture, you know, mm. Milo, Yiannopoulos, those guys. Yeah. And he like embedded with them for a while. And whatever, like we've done episodes that I've been very critical of cancel culture and political correctness and stuff. So mm. this is the one episode where, you know, I covered the obscene, you know, kind of right wingish, trollish people. Mm -hmm. And I got a couple of emails from like, you know, people who felt like I was shilling for the deep state. That was one of the subjects of the email. Mm -hmm. Deep state shill. Hidden oh, voices is now deep state shill. So I don't know. What are you going to do? It's like few extreme voices that get amplified. Mm. And you must have to deal with that too. Though. All the time. I mean, you can imagine what the conventional economists think of me. So I cop crap for them and I have for the last literally 50 years. Just shy of 50 years. It'll be 50 years, of copying, 50. 50 years of copying shit from neoclassical <laughs> economists will be in 2021. Uh. So I'm not too far away from it. So that gave me a fairly thick skin but for somebody who's inherently fairly sensitive, having to cope with being rubbished and ridiculed all the time. And then, of course, I take on the Austrian perspective, even though I've got sympathies with some parts of Austrian thinking, so I cop it from there. My first target in terms of academic writing was Marxists because I could not accept the labor theory of value. When you were still studying? When you yeah, were when I was still studying. I was an undergrad or a graduate student? Undergrad. There's you went to the University of Sydney? Yep, yep, which was a fabulous place to go in the period I went. It's still a pretty good university, but when I was there, it was right in the middle of the Vietnam War, so we were stupid enough to join America in invading Vietnam. Did you and have long hair back then? Yeah, I did. In fact, it was actually an afro. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I feel I, like I've actually seen that picture. Like, I remember once I bell just- Bell bottoms, jeans. Bell bottoms, yes, I could admit to those. Leather jacket? Uh, never a leather jacket, but I had some pretty amazing crochet tops and stuff like <laughs> that. But I remember one time, I, I mean, my hair was so curly once, I just looked in the mirror and, and just made a little mental note of what it looked like. And my girlfriend remarked on how curly it was. And I said, it looks like I combed my hair with an Alka-Seltzer. Alka-Seltzer. She broke down, broke up. But yeah, that's how hairy. And of course, now I'm down the usual story, gray, short haired. And if it goes along, it looks scraggly. So I'm off to get a cut after this interview, I think. That's so interesting. We should actually get into the whole boomer thing on Bitcoin. We were talking about that mm. earlier. But you mentioned Austrian economics. This is something else we were talking about before we started. When I had capital account, well, before the financial crisis to back up, the way that I undid a lot of the misperceptions that I had developed during the course of my undergraduate degree in economics yeah. was to chance upon Austrian economic theory, yeah. particularly the theory of the business cycle. And I was reading those guys and those guys helped me see the crisis. And then when the crisis came, I doubled down on Austrian economic theory yeah. and I kind of became very ideological. Mm -hmm. And I've spent the last however many years, maybe seven years, really mm -hmm. since 2012, since it became clear that the Austrian models that I was using to interpret the economy were not explaining what I was seeing. Yeah, well, they got there. We were certainly okay, but getting the approach of a crisis and the aftermath of the crisis, they got completely wrong because they basically expected, because of the government response, they expected hyperinflation. I don't know how many of them are aware of this, but they're based on the model that banks lend out reserves, this money multiplier model. Yeah. And they have this enormous increase in reserves by Bernanke. I think he literally added about $2 trillion to the reserve accounts of banks in, in less than a year. It was a ridiculous increase in the reserves. And then if you believe that model, then there was going to be an enormous surge of inflation. And the more pragmatic approach to economics that I come from, which is the post-Keynesian school, Oh, that I'm, and I won't say I come from influenced by the post Keynesians. Call myself a complexity theorist when I actually want to put a serious tag on myself. But they looked at the mechanics of banking, and this was actually understood before the Great Depression as well by people like Schumpeter, some even some mainstream economists. Banks create money by lending, but they cannot lend out reserves. There's one condition under which they can lend reserves, and that is all loans are in cash. Now, if you walk into a bank and they lend you a million dollars, and you have to walk out with a wheelbarrow then maybe the idea that loan reserves makes sense. But they don't do that. They give you a 
uh, you know, an increase in your deposit account. And that means they simply, in terms of accounting, cannot lend the reserves out. So from our point of view, so that's not going to do anything. Well, they create the reserves. Well, the, the lending, it, it actually works in reverse in some ways. Lending, the loan creates a deposit. So you right. go to the bank, they say, yep, buying that flat in Manhattan is a great idea. Here's $2 million. And by the way, you owe us $2 million. So the, as, their assets and your liabilities rise by $2 million. Their liabilities and your assets rise by $2 million. You then spend that $2 million buying the property off somebody else. So you create demand doing it as well. But the reserves themselves play no role in that unless you bank at a different bank than the person you bought the property off. And then the reserves act like deposit accounts for private banks at the, reserve, the central bank. That's their main role. So they circulate in a completely independent system. Is yeah. the reserve ratio an anachronism or a legacy of the gold standard? To some extent. that It's become a legacy because of textbook misinterpretations of what the reserve ratio is actually there for. There's a brilliant paper by a guy called O'Brien. I think he was a reserve staff when he wrote it, talking about reserve ratios in OECD countries. He goes through each of them. And the reserve ratio in America is 10%. Take a look at the fine print. It's 10% on banks above a certain level of deposits. I think it's about $30 million. So it's quite a small level, but it's 10% of household deposits. For corporate deposits, it's zero. Mm. For overseas commercial holdings, it's zero. It's there in case the households panic, go to the bank and want to take money out. If 10% of your customers turn up in one day, withdraw the money, it's a bad day. But if you have 10% cash on hand, you can catch them and then the reserve will rush the cash to you before the next banking day starts and you won't run out of money. So it's there in case there's a panic by the household sector, fundamentally. Mm. When you look at the actual proportion of the cash flow of America, which is actually affected by those reserve ratios, it's less than 2% of the money supply. There are some good Federal Reserve papers. O'Brien's one, another by uh, Carpenter and Demel Rapp, I think it is, do the same thing. And they go and say, look, at, looking at the practicalities, it doesn't really exist as a ratio. But it's still part of the mindset people have about how they interpret banking. You and I got into a conversation about this on Twitter not long ago. Okay. There was someone else on that thread. Mm. I can't remember who it was. Someone from the Bitcoin community. And they were talking about reserve ratios, mm. et cetera. You remember this conversation? And then Michael Kumhoff's name came up. Yeah, yeah Michael's a good friend. Right. We yeah. had dinner with Michael in 2012. Remember that? Or in yeah, 20... yeah, it was a great It was a dinner. sushi restaurant. And it was with a guy from the old American Monetary Institute, from Stephen Zalenga. Maybe. I think it was maybe. Stephen Zalenga. Yeah. We had dinner yeah. another time with another guy who was a hedge fund manager here in New York. Yeah. You was always bringing these interesting characters mm. with you on your trips to DC, mm. or people would end up meeting. It was a fun time doing mm. that. So, what are you working on these days? Well, I'm still working on the monetary stuff. I've actually built a software package called Minsky for mathematical modeling of financial dynamics and general dynamics as well. So, that's the monetary stuff is still alive and well. But one thing which has always troubled me about economics, and not just neoclassical economics here, but Austrian, Marxian, post-Keynesian, none of them have acknowledged the role of energy in production. Mm. So they all pretend you can produce output by combining labor and capital. And this always felt unsatisfactory to me. And I've seen various attempts to try to bring energy in to the theory of production. And what they're fundamentally, they say, well, you've got labor and you've got capital and you've got energy. And they'll then say, you know, there are three factors of production. And I looked at that and thought, well, two things are wrong with that. First of all, if you use the neoclassical model, which is called the Cobb-Douglas production function, after the two people who dreamt it up in the 1920s or 30s, I think, it has labor raised to one power, capital to another power. And then if you have energy, one minus the other two powers. So it gives you what they call constant returns to scale. I'll show you the maths later. But when you do that, if you set the coefficients at the inverted commas right level, you can say you have output with no energy input, still using it that way, which just felt it was never satisfied with that. Even people who did a more advanced model would still go How, through that stage. <laughs> did they set up any kind of constants to deal with that? How did they deal with that? Well, they just seemed they could leave it out. Uh. And I thought that is not adequate. So I was working with a guy who was the leading physicist involved in economics trying to bring energy in a guy called Bob Ayers. And Bob's house was full of statues as it happens. And just walking back from the bathroom one night, this little insight popped into my brain, which was labor without energy is a corpse. Capital without energy is a sculpture. 
And I thought, holy shit, that's the solution. Energy is an input to labor and capital. Mathematically speaking, you put energy as an argument into your labor, energy into argument to capital. And that gives it the role that says, if you don't have energy input, you can't get output either. It makes it absolutely fundamental. So I worked that out in about 2016. I've been working in that since. And of course, that's dragged me into climate change. And in looking at it- So you started researching climate change in 2016? Probably actually last year, 2018. 2018. Because I was, you had to write up these papers and I was still working on the monetary work. And so I decided, of course, in 2018, Nolderhouse gets the Nobel Prize for economics. And my initial reaction- What's his specialty in economics? Climate change. Oh, really? The economics of climate change. And so my initial reaction was, well, at least they've given it, I mean, I'm a huge critic of the Nobel Prize. I think it should be abolished. The Economics Nobel Prize. You do know that it is not a Nobel Prize. You know what? So I know a little bit about this okay. because we had Brian, uh, I can't remember his last name now. He was in competition to win the Nobel Prize in physics. This was an episode- That's the real Cosmo. Nobel Prize. The real Nobel Prize. Yeah, and yeah. I learned as a result, a lot of the dirty politics that have to do with the Nobel Prize- well, there's, there's politics in all elements of the right. prize, no doubt about that. But what do you mean it's not, the Economics Prize is not Well, the Nobel actual prize. title of the prize is, I can't pronounce it properly because it's the Swedish Central Bank. The Svisberg- Bank Award in Economics in honor of Alfred Nobel. That's its proper title. It was invented in 1969. This is all the literature. So does the Nobel Committee have any view on this? Well, they because they got 1.4 million krona or whatever it was, $1.4 million effectively from the central bank to pay for the prize each year. They oh, are, they license it. They effectively license it. They license it. They the name. They're like Trump. It. They're like <laughs> and, Trump um, Hotel. And they like the whole, the whole thing. The Nobel Prize family has been up in arms about it because apparently Nobel himself, Alfred Nobel- He was the inventor of gunpowder, wasn't this he? This is uh, one funny story about, and I'm not sure this is true. I've got to read more thoroughly on this point, but what I have been told is that Nobel read his own obituary. I think that is true. Okay. In, I think this he was is in, coming back to me. He was in Russia, yeah. I think it was, and his brother died. And the newspapers mistook his brother for him and published the, of course, all, all newspapers. Yes, have it's correct. This is correct. His role with this the, also. Yeah. And there it is saying, they, they slaughtered so many people, greatest mass killer in history. And he apparently looked and thought, that's how I'm going to be remembered? No, yeah. thank you. So he invents the prize. So his name is now associated with something positive. And that's, of course, how we think about him these days. But he had the prize in chemistry, in physics, in medicine, I think in literature and peace. Okay, there were five actual- The peace one is the biggest bullshit. Kissinger got that in like 74. And Obama he? gets it as well. It's yeah. going to be a, it, it's But ridiculous. the Kissinger one is like the worst. Yeah, like, I know. Absolutely. The moment absolutely. Henry Kissinger got it, it completely delegitimized the well, Nobel this, Peace this Prize. Was, see, the Nobel Prize for economics was never legitimate. It starts with people like Milton Friedman being awarded it, you know- my opinion of Friedman is unprintable. Also, Krugman got it. Ditto, unprintable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can, we can print a few things on that front. But he, I had no respect for the prize itself. But the prize was invented by the Swedish Central Bank. And there's a very good book called The Nobel Factor, which explains the history of it. And it was at a time when the Central Bank in Sweden was effectively at war with a progressive political leadership of the country, and they were championing a neoliberal, what we now call neoliberal economics approach by instituting the prize. And it's been highly successful. So I've always been skeptical of it, critical of it, thinking it should be shut down. When Nordhaus got it, my first reaction, well, at least they gave it for climate change. And then I thought, hang on a second. I was one of the first people to read The Limits to Growth. Okay, I read Danilo it back- Meadows. In 1972. 72. It's my most thumbed book. It was badly bound, it's fallen apart like crazy. But I bought a copy in 72 and read it back then. And I was, as somebody with a mathematical training at the time, I really appreciated what they were doing with the technology of system dynamics. So I liked mm -hmm. it. Nordhaus destroyed it. Nordhaus destroyed its credibility with a set of papers, one of which was called Measurement Without Data, disparaging it completely and played a major role in driving this approach out of economics. And in subsequent years, I've met one of the three authors, and Randers. In fact, I met him again about two weeks ago in Norway. And Randers told me when I first met him, this is back in Sydney in about 2009, I think, that when they developed Limits to Growth, they thought economists would be really happy about the idea because it was a technology that meant you didn't have to assume equilibrium anymore. Because what was actually lying behind Limits to Growth is what called system dynamics engineering. And that fundamentally says that every... Effectively, the old story, everything is connected to everything else. But you then 
put the feedback effects between those various things, and you can both model a system out of equilibrium, and you can also try to get the magnitudes right so you don't get the case that you know, you've got to ignore everything. Rather than ceteris paribus, you have the major feedbacks tied together. But they've only been able to begin to model these systems recently, right? They weren't able to use these models to model them because of the computational overload. Well, this, this limits to growth was the first major computational model, mm. and it was done between 1968 and 1971. Right, because they, 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 they had computers mainframe that... computers back in those days. It cost, you know, back in those days, the actual cost was well over a million dollars to build the model and run it. It took weeks in what was then a supercomputer to get the runs out. These days, you can run. There's actually a program on the web called Insight Maker. Insight Maker. And Insight Maker, somebody has used Insight Maker to build the limits to growth as an Insight Maker model. Mm -hmm. You can run it on. You run it on a PC, it runs on a cloud as well, and it you know takes a matter of seconds to run the model. Back then, it took weeks for any of the particular runs to be done. It was a giant supercomputer in those days doing the work, so it was very difficult. But we, we could have been doing this approach to modeling the economy from the early 1970s. Now, instead, not only do they reject the limits to growth, they specifically being Nordhaus, who led the charge by economists against the limits to growth, they also rejected the whole technology. So rather than learning how to model systems out of equilibrium, with interacting systems and feedbacks often being more important than direct effects, they got even more obsessed with the approach of equilibrium thinking. And so the divergence of economics from understanding the real world, which the real world is a complex system which is normally far from equilibrium. That's the methodology we need to get to. Wouldn't they argue that they try to approximate that complexity by thinking about it in terms of dynamic equilibria? Well, yeah, but there's no such thing. And you're still I, stuck in a paradigm of equilibrium. Yeah, I mean, like for, when I first arrived at university, as going back to do my master's degree as a prelude to doing my PhD, which is about 10 or 15 years after I finished my undergraduate degree, one of the colleagues I had at the University of New South Wales, you don't think I mentioned, I mean, mentioning a guy called Peter Chrysler, he's still there today. Peter would talk about how, from his post Keynesian point of view, economics can talk about the equilibrium, but what about the traverse? And I looked at him and sort of shook my head, what do you mean traverse? He said, well, the movement from one equilibrium to another. And coming from a dynamics background, I said, well, you don't actually start an equilibrium, you don't end there either. Yeah. You move your equilibria reference points for an overall system, but virtually every interesting system is being driven by some external force. Like, for example, you and I are driven by the sun, mm -hmm. okay? If it wasn't shining most of the time, then you know life wouldn't exist, let alone the conversations we're having. And so there's a force that gives you a pressure that means the system is driven away from its equilibrium. And the things like the way we model the weather these days, that was the weather system in terms of the ultimate nonlinearity of weather and the fact that it's out of equilibrium. That was first brought into meteorology by a guy called Lorenz in 1963. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, Edward Lorenz. Yeah, yeah. And Lorenz- He was uh, a climatologist. Climatologist, a mathematical climatologist. And he was critical of all the models of the weather that existed at the time, which would do things like pattern matching. So they'd say like seven days in a row, like this had happened 32 years ago. So we're going to predict whether tomorrow is going to be like it was on the eighth day, 32 years ago. Or they do linear regressions. And he said, look, we know the major forces are nonlinear. And he took what's called the Navier-Stokes equations, which are equations that describe fluid dynamics, incredibly complicated, what are called partial differential equations. I think there's about 11 components of this what are called 11-dimensional model. He reduced it using mathematical procedures to a set of what are called ordinary differential equations. So only time rather than space and time is the causal for driving variables with just three variables and three constants for those three variables. Incredibly simple model, mm. which generated incredibly what we you first of all called chaotic, we now yeah. call complex systems Very pattern. dense data set. Dense, but it doesn't occupy the entire what's called phase space. So if you drew a container saying, where could you be in this space? And you put the Lorenz model inside it, there'd be parts of it that it would never occupy. And three parts that it would never occupy are the equilibria. Mm. They're all unstable, all three of them. Mm -hmm. But the system remains inside the bounding box defined by the overall system, but nowhere near the equilibria. It's actually repelled from the equilibria. So this is common knowledge in genuine sciences. But economics is stuck with this obsession that everything's in equilibrium. Or you talk about a movement from one equilibrium to another, which is what you mean by dynamic equilibrium. These neoclassical models came out of the late 19th century? 
Was that when uh, yeah, Walrus was writing? The, the, the neoclassical economics has changed more than the neoclassical economists realize. They're actually ignorant of their own history. So if you go back and see who were the progenitors of neoclassical economics, you go back to Corno, who was a mathematician writing in the early 1800s in France. It's interesting, both French, and Jean-Baptiste Say. And Say was a foil for Ricardo. And Ricardo was somebody who came from the classical school of economics. We can have a chat about mm -hmm. Ricardo, who's actually a con man too, by the way. Who? Ricardo? Ricardo was a con man, yeah. I, I've written a cartoon book. I should have bought a cartoon book for you. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you an electronic copy. But anyway, Ricardo followed what's called the classical school of economics. And the classical school- Ricardo uh, gave us comparative advantage. Yeah, and other, other pieces of garbage as well. But the main thing he gave was- Well, use there is some truth to that theory, right? That no. The, no. None at all? No. So for our listeners, why don't you put <laughs> forward what the theory of comparative advantage is and okay. why it doesn't work in your view. I'm no. not saying- all the extrapolations of it, but the basic idea that you can, you could be better in two things than I am mm -hmm. in, in those two things, but it could be to my comparative advantage to do one of them mm -hmm. and allow you to do the other. Yeah, I mean, we, and we use in this, our little micro economy. And our, in our micro worlds, that sort of stuff makes sense. I mean, I am, for example, a lousy housekeeper. Okay, my partner is a brilliant housekeeper. She actually drives me away from the housekeeping. So, and that's how convenient. Of, how convenient. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry about that. I and mean, we can easily extrapolate that individual experience to a economy level, which is where comparative advantage right. is applied. Now, if you look at Ricardo, you can see what he was trying to do, and that is he had a fundamental belief that capitalism would grow faster and last in its growth phase longer if he could get money away from the landlords and get it to the capitalists. That was his real intention. He actually says that at one stage. It's been my objective to show that wages cannot rise without a fall in profits and vice versa. So that the way to get more growth is to get more money to profits. Workers get a, a subsistence wage. Therefore, the way to increase the gap is to reduce the cost of subsistence, which you do by abolishing the corn laws and bringing in corn more cheaply, meaning wheat as it happens. Mm -hmm. But that was the logic. But in the theory of comparative advantage, what he did was a brilliant piece of debating. He said, I'm going to accept the case made by my opponents, the mercantilists, who said that, look, we believe... In that, in that days, the, Portugal was the major rival that the UK faced. Portugal is better at producing everything than we are. So if we have free trade, Portugal will wipe out all our industries. And what Ricardo said, I'm going to take your belief that Portugal is better at everything than us and show you that it's still in our advantage to have trade. So it's a very clever and it's a con man argument. Okay. So he was writing in the late 18th century? No, the, the early 18th. Early, 18, early 18, 19th. 18, 12, 18, 17. That sort of period, late, late, so late nineteen. Late, I mean, early nineteenth. Yeah, century. late, late, late seventeen hundreds, early eighteen hundreds. Yeah, yeah. The actually the reason I said he's a con man is that I remember a friend of mine who used to do a thing called Planet Wall Street back in Australia, told me a story about the Battle of Waterloo. Who's one of the ultimate evil people in capitalism? Uh, the Rothschilds or that sort of the person. Rothschilds. Uh, the, one of they those. Definitely, they one definitely of those. One of top. those. He told me he had a runner at the Battle of Waterloo to see oh, who right. won. I heard and the as story. soon as the battle was over, the rider just rode as fast as he could, the boat was ready, all the stuff, to get to the London Stock Exchange. And Rothschild, this is what my friend right, right, right. tells me, he walks out onto the floor of the London Stock Exchange and goes, sell. <laughs> I wish that our listeners could see your dramatic <laughs> performance right now. And there's absolute panic on the pandemonium. Everybody thinks, oh my God, we must have lost the Battle of Waterloo. Massive sale. And then he <laughs> says, Boy, <laughs> it wasn't. I've still got to check this fully, but it wasn't a Rothschild. It was David Ricardo, and he made a profit at the time estimated at over. How one... do we know this is true? This could be fake news. I've got to check and it out because I've only seen it. Be fake I've news. Seen it in... We're spreading rumors. We're defaming yeah. this man. Well, anyway, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll more do than more research. Than years just since his death, because I went looking for it <laughs> because I wrote a cartoon book on this topic. You see, what part of a cartoon was an introduction to how bad economics was called econ comics. I think I read that. Did you? They used to do Superman pictures of you. That's Who right. Was, that's that's right. the guy that used yeah, to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I wanted to write this thing about not David Ricardo, but David Tricardo. Oh, okay. har har. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what I did. And I was looking, I knew about this story and I went back and looked about when did Ricardo you know, write and so on, because I wanted to see the publication date of the principles of political economy. And I wanted it to be an April Fool's joke gone bad. And it turned out it was published on, the, I think, the 17th of April. So it actually published in the month I wanted. Then I found Ricardo was the one who pulled this stunt about the Battle of Waterloo, made a million, literally, in those days, 
and had to leave the country and go and live in sort of rural exile before he finally bought himself a seat in parliament and came back and lobbied for the Corn Laws. So that's the guy we're talking about. No doubt a great intellect, but a con man. Financial history is full of these really great stories because they're so personal, you yeah, know? Yeah. And they're people under immense stress. We did this episode with Daniel Paris on the history of financial theory, yeah, mm-hmm. where we covered this in part. But to bring it back to the conversation about climate change, yeah. I haven't read Limits to Growth, but I have read Thinking in Systems by Danella yep. Meadows. It, it was a, a fantastic book. Mm. I would recommend it to anyone who's interested in learning about systems theory and nonlinear dynamics. Mm. I also read James Glake's book, Chaos. Yeah, that's uh, pretty he, good. Where he talked about Lorenz and lots of other people, Mandelbrot. Mm. And you've written about the physiocrats, yep. which deals with this thing about bringing energy into yeah. the equation. But let's go back to, you said 2018, about a year or two yeah. ago. So first of all, how did you educate yourself on climate change? How did you go about doing that? I've been reading this for 30 or 40 years. Okay, so you've been interested in the subject ever going since, back ever to the since 70s. Re- reading Limits to Growth in the very first instance, I've always kept an eye on, on the, the physics of the biosphere. So I've had an awareness of the research being done and how serious it was. And then, of course, because I'm now going to start writing on the economics of it, but bringing in the role of energy, because I can now do equations about production where energy is necessarily involved. And with energy necessarily involved, you necessarily have waste because of the second law of thermodynamics. And so I can tie economics and ecology in at the foundational level. And that's what I'm working on as a positive agenda right now. But I also remembered Nordhaus, went back and saw this measurement with our data, evisceration of limits to growth, where he clearly didn't understand the technology he was dealing with. And then I started reading his material. And because I thought I had, if I'm going to make comments on climate change from my perspective, then I have to understand the orthodoxy as well. And what I expected was that even I can be naive on neoclassical economics, which is ridiculous because I'm probably the most cynical person about <laughs> neoclassical economics on the planet, but I still had higher expectations of them than I actually found because what I thought was they would have taken the damage estimates that were being made by physicists and meteorologists about what's going to happen with climate change. And then they were discounting those because they're far in the future and saying it's trivial now. Why worry about it? They do that as well. But in fact, they haven't used the damage estimates of physicists and scientists. They've made their own ones up. And the way they've made them up is about three methods they've used. One is what they call the statistical method. And that on the surface sounds reasonable. Let's use statistics. What they've done is assume that the weak relationship we can find today between income of a particular region and the temperature of that region can be used to predict what's going to happen with climate change. So they literally take, for example, the gross state product data for America, output per per capita in Nevada, output per capita in Florida, output per capita in New York. Take that data. Take the data as well on temperature, do a scatter diagram, do a fit to it, and they say that fit will tell you what's going to happen when temperature rises 10 degrees. So what's the reasoning behind that? I'm not sure I follow. (sighs) Can I swear on your podcast? No. Okay. (laughs) It is sheer, unbelievable, ignorant stupidity. It is because neoclassical economists- I love how you use stupidity in place of whatever it is that was in your head originally. Oh, mate. I mean, I, I, <laughs> when I first read this material, the, the line, it, it comes- Were you a, at the OECD giving a presentation? Yeah. And on it was p- this. Was he there? Richard Toll? No, he wasn't. Okay. Nor Nordhaus. Yeah. They wouldn't have enjoyed it. Someone was sitting next to you and laughing, though, when you brought up some- You gave an example of what would happen in their model if temperature dropped by like- Four degrees. Four degrees. Yeah, yeah. And that GDP would drop by like 2% or something? Uh, I think it was 3.6% fall in GDP if temperature fell by 4 degrees. But you also showed a map of like like half of North America would have been frozen. Yeah, and because what they have done, it's something which neoclassical economists do all the time. They think they need a simplifying assumption. And what they call a simplifying assumption, any sane person would call a fantasy. And that's what they did in this particular case. So they said, we don't have any data on what's going to happen to income as temperature rises. So let's assume that the relationship we see between temperature and GDP today can be used as a proxy of what's going to happen to GDP as temperature rises over time. 
And the way that's stated and when I, in the paper I first read it was by Richard Toll. I think it was economic. Why do I know that name? He's a, he's a troll. He's a troll. You'll find him on Twitter all the time. His last name is not troll, though. It's, it's toll. damn close. <laughs> and he'd be more honest. Well, why do if I it know that name, though? You would, he's, he's fairly prominent. You would Richard have, Toll. He actually writes the IPCC reports. Maybe I'm thinking of Richard Vague. Very different human Very being. Different you human being. you, you like have to Richard. have Richard on your show. He's brilliant. <laughs> troll is a troll. But anyway, in this article, which was used as the basis for the inverted commas data that Nordhaus fitted what he calls his damage function to, which shows the relationship between his predicted relationship between increase in temperature and change in GDP. Toll's paper from 2009 was the basis of that. So I'm reading this paper, and there are various points in the paper where he hedges quite sensibly about how reliable what's being done by economists is. But at one point, he says that a particular study by a guy called Mendelssohn assumes that the temperature and GDP relationships we see across space will apply across time as well. Something to that effect. I don't understand that. I think I saw Neither does he. That. I think okay. I saw that in your presentation. Do you have, how about what actually, I'm, I'll actually grab it and quote it because I've got it in my machine. Do you want the quote? Can we sure. Do that? Okay. So the Richard Toll wrote a, a survey paper of the work that economists had done to, to try to predict the damages from climate change. It's called The Economic Effects of Climate Change, published in the Journal of Economic Perspectives in 2009. And I'll now find the quote where he points out how they develop the data, one type of set of data that is used to calibrate the economist estimates of the damage from climate change. Okay. Mendelssohn's work can be called the statistical approach. It is based on direct estimates of the welfare impacts using observed variations, brackets across space within a single country, close brackets, in prices and expenditures to discern the effects of climate. Mendelssohn assumes that the observed variation of economic activity with climate over space holds over time as well and uses climate models to estimate the future effect of climate change. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I still don't really understand what that means. Okay, what it means is how important do you think is temperature in determining the income of New York versus the income of Florida? I'm compared sure to everything I'm sure else. it's important. I don't know how important it is. No, it's trivial. It I mean, okay. it's the technology that's in New York. If it, it yeah, but had, that can't be true. Well, in other words, what I'm saying is- temp, uh, Temperature plays a minor role, okay? But temperature plays a, an important role in determining what type of economy is born out of that region, right? Like you don't have a tropical vacation economy in, in New York. No, but you couldn't use climate to rule out Singapore. To rule out Singapore. Yeah, as a wealthy country, Okay. It's got a really hot climate. It's got a wealthy country. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not saying that. But like, I mm. mean, you know, there are important different. Anyway, I mean, I think there are important differences. Yeah, but the, the, depends on how you're. Sort it it, of it plays a role it. because you, if you actually plot the data, and I've done this to my own little fit, you can find a, a rough relationship, a very very trivial relationship between temperature and GDP. Well, Much, aren't hotter areas like? Yeah, yeah, generally not lower as income. Wealthy. Yeah, 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 and really cold ones are not as wealthy as well. Okay, but what you get out of that is a weak relationship because there are many other factors that are you know, more important. Culture being one, sure. Lee Kuan Yew and Singapore being another. Mm -hmm. Okay, factors that are more important than the temperature itself overall. And secondly, it's a mild relationship. It's you know not the case that if you move to a place that's ten degrees warmer, the economy will disappear completely. Mm -hmm. Okay, it'll be less than now but it won't be completely obliterated, okay? So your argument is not, or the point you're making isn't that temperature it doesn't play an important role in the type of economy, it's just that it doesn't play an important role in the extent of income. In yeah, well, the income saying, I'm saying that it, it can't tell you what's going to happen if you increase or decrease the entire global temperature that much. Okay. Because what's happening with global warming fundamentally is we're blanketing, using you know, chemically blanketing, if you like, the, the sun, so that some of the earth, the energy which is normally reflected off the earth, gets trapped for a longer period and therefore warms the overall planet. So there's an increase in, in the, the lower atmosphere. Yeah, there's an increase in the energy in the biosphere overall, okay? And that energy increase is why we're talking about a temperature increase. Now, the energy increase, the amount of extra energy retaining from the sun is gigantic. I mean, when I did an estimate at one stage of how many atom bombs we'd need to explode to make similar increase in energy for one and a half degrees Celsius. I mean, you're talking thousands of Hiroshima bombs a day type level of increase in energy in the biosphere given the amount of extra energy retaining from the sun. So it's a huge change in the energy in the system. Now, when you're saying, let's compare the GDP of 
gross state product of Dakota to New York to Miami. That's all with a constant level of energy in the biosphere. Now, the important question is what happens when you change the amount of energy in the biosphere? So that relationship exists, but it's not going to tell you thing, anything about increasing energy on the overall planet, which is why I use the example of global cooling rather than global warming, because the, the relationship they've fitted to this current GDP and temperature data is simply a parabola, y equals x squared. Okay, The x there being the difference between current temperatures and temperature before industrialization began. So if you're talking a temperature four degrees higher than pre-industrial, they're going to say it's 16 times a coefficient, where well, the coefficient tells you how much damage does that do to your GDP. Now, the coefficient Nordhaus is now using is 0 0.00227 times the temperature difference squared over pre-industrial. That's less than one quarter of 1%, okay? 0 0.25, 0 0.0025 is one quarter, he's using 0 0.00227. So what he's saying, a one degree increase in temperature over pre-industrial will reduce GDP by less than one quarter of 1%. Mm. Okay, a two degree, there may be two squared, which is four, by less than one. So you're saying he won the Nobel Prize for this? He won the Nobel Prize for it. And if you take a look at his Nobel Prize lecture, you'll see he has a graph showing various temperature directories, depending on whether we do or don't try so to- So what does he get for a 10 degree rise? Huh? What does it get for a 10 About degree About a 23% rise? Percent fall in GDP. A 10 degree rise would be catastrophic for the planet. A ten, we, the life would cease. That means, first of all, at 10 degrees, all the ice caps melt, right? Oh, well, they're gone at probably about five, but yeah, right. yeah. Just be be no clear, we're not having be... a conversation here about whether or not the earth is warming. We're having a yeah, conversation if here it about did. If, 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 if temperatures did, rose. By I mean, 10 degrees. Yeah. The, the only ice would be left to be on the cap of Mount Everest. And the, yeah. So you'd be talking 70, 80 meter sea rise, okay? You'd is that be, how much it would be really? Something of that order, 70 or 80 meters of extra ocean. Wow. And the life, I mean, you've heard what's called the wet bulb temperature measure? No, what's that? Okay, you, you know, you use the thermometer to measure temperature, obviously, the mercury thermometer. If you wrap that in a wet cloth, then the evaporation of the cloth. Oh, is this the water vapor in the atmosphere? Water vapor. It, Heat, it's saying if you completely it's a feedback loop. What, what? Not so much a feedback loop, but the the evaporation. If you like, it say it's fifty degrees outside, and you put a, oh, a sock around yeah. something, then it, the evaporation will cool as much as the mm. heat rises. So uh, it turns out that if you measure thirty five degrees on a wet bulb thermometer, that is a temperature level at which our cooling systems, humans' cooling systems, break down. So we can no longer sweat to drive our body temperature down below the exterior temperature, and we will die within six hours at that temperature. Now, if you had a 10 degree increase in temperature, th that would mean that most of the tropics and a fair bit of the subtropics would be uninhabitable. Hmm. Now, so these enormous changes are being trivialized. What Troll will say is that I'll, he has a cutoff point. He doesn't imagine it's going to go that high, so it's only go to four or six degrees. But he literally does talk about six degree temperature increase and four degrees. This is Nordhaus. Talks about a four degree temperature increase as optimal. Optimal literally. based on the cost that it would take to, yeah. Yeah, so to we, intervene and yeah. uh, reduce yeah. emissions. And that chart in his 2018 Nobel Prize lecture, which you can find online, he has one chart showing this set of trajectories and without any mitigation at all, that trajectory shows temperature being six degrees above pre-industrial by about 2160, 2170. His optimal eventually stabilizes at four degrees above pre-industrial in about 2140. And he calls it optimal because when he does the cost of climate change mm. versus the cost of mitigation, the smallest sum of the two is with a four degree increase. I feel like the conversations about what to do yeah. miss the point that the point of friction isn't the dollar amount. Mm. And let's actually move beyond simply talking about climate and talk about the environment yeah. more broadly, because yeah. I think you and I will both agree that the environment's important and <laughs> conserving the environment is something that we should aim to do. You know, mm. It's sort of organically already happening with plastics, with straws and things like mm. this. But this thing about the money and how much it would cost, I don't think that's the point of friction. The point of friction is the political inertia, right? How mm. are we supposed to do something about the environment in a world where we, we require international cooperation mm. and we're at a time where international cooperation is moving in the other direction? 
Yeah, well, I think we're going to be forced into it. The climate doesn't give a shit about our politics, okay? It doesn't give a shit about our paralysis either. So whatever we do or fail to do, ultimately the consequences of climate change will strike us and then we'll make the reactions in that political environment. And I think that political environment is going to be so severe, so extreme, that what we call capitalism will no longer survive. So I should also mention to listeners, two great episodes to listen to that are related to our conversation today are with Brian Arthur on complexity science and mm -hmm. complexity economics. And the other one is with Jeffrey West on what are scale. effectively the limits scale. Yeah, scale, brilliant book. The limits, yeah. exactly. There are physical limits mm. to growth and mm. that socioeconomic limits are not the same as physical limits. Yeah, yeah. And those two systems don't really work very well together at the limit. So to go back to what I was saying, some of the things I've seen related to what the effects of climate change or the projections of what mm. climate change, the effects of that are going to be, the most damaging are not the climate related directly. Mm. They're population related, mm. right? Because if you do have flooding in all those low lying areas in Southeast Asia- Then people have got to move or yeah. drown. Yeah. yeah. And like some latest studies have found we're actually been overestimating the height of some of those regions, not- underestimating the amount of water that's going to be produced, but overestimating how tall they already are. And it looks like most of Vietnam and a fair bit of Bangladesh will be underwater in the next 20 or 30 years. It's ridiculous how close that so could be. So what does that mean for the world? Let's just follow yeah. one particular outcome. Let's assume that we do see rising temperature levels mm -hmm. and that we just continue on the path that we're on right now, mm. sort of the path of least resistance. Mm. Give me a scenario that you've come up with in your head about what the world could look like 10, 20, 30, 50 years into the future. Well, the transition will involve some parts of the world being forcibly evacuated, which means, of course, massive refugee flows, which means refugees flows into countries that they're not wanted in, which means political conflict. And I think, to me, the most volatile area is going to be around Bangladesh and India. And of course, Bangladesh, so far as we know, doesn't have nuclear weapons, but Pakistan does. And uh, the potential is there for political and nuclear conflict between those countries. Mm. We have collapse in food systems will happen because the analogy that I make to climate change is like putting the lid on a pot that's on the stove already. And the temperature, of course, is going to rise because of that, which means that the circulating cells in that which they call Bernard cells, they're going to change location. Where the water goes up and where the water goes down will change because of putting the lid on the pot. The same thing with increasing the temperature. Those up and downs are what give us the large scale climatic effects that give us rain in the wheat belt and things like that. If they move, and they're moving quite rapidly already, if they break down as well. So for example, the what are called the polar vortex and the Antarctic vortex, if they break down, then those regions which are freezing now will suddenly become affected by the overall circulation of the rest of the planet, meaning the climate change is radically there as well. So the food systems we rely upon will break down. We can't necessarily move to areas where the rain will occur because you need topsoil to grow, and topsoil does not grow in a matter of centuries. So you need sunlight. You need, and the, well, you, the areas that have the most sunlight are in areas now that are warm enough but not too cold. In yeah. other words- if you had all the ice melt in Canada, mm. even if you had all the topsoil in the world, you will only have so many days of sunlight. Yeah, that's there are only true. Certain that's true. types of crops yeah. that will grow in those areas. That's a good point. I hadn't actually thought of that yeah. one beforehand, but you're right. So those sorts of things mean you can't just simply shift the physical location of growing wheat from somewhere in Iowa to somewhere in Alberta. Is that one of the the reasons that some people are investing early stage in some of these Soylent or Impossible Burger style companies. It isn't mm. just a cultural fad, but in fact, there's a push to try and find alternative sources of food. I've seen similar stuff with cricket protein. Yeah, I can imagine that's happening. I mean, if you're a technologist, you know, I'm, I'm unfortunately an economist by training, but if you're a technologist and you're seeing this as a possibility, then you're going to be researching that as a potential profit opportunity or let alone survival opportunity in future. But yeah, all this stuff means a breakdown of the structure of the climate that currently sustains our civilization. And when scientists have looked at this, their estimates are that if we had a four degree increase in temperature, we might be able to sustain a billion people. Now, Nordhaus is calling four degree increase in temperature optimal, 
and his model has no link between population growth and climate. Population just simply assumed to grow to the estimates of the United Nations of the peak carrying capacity of the planet, which I think is 10 and a half billion people. So his model assumes we're going to have 10 and a half billion people with a four degree increase in temperature and GDP will be about 3.6% lower than it would have been in the complete absence how, of climate change. First of all, how change. reliable are these estimates either way? The carrying Absolutely. capacity of the planet. Who the well, hell knows what the carrying capacity of the planet is? Well, you that, can make extremely well, rough estimates. Well, that's the trouble. So we are trying to predict what's going to happen in circumstances that the planet itself potentially has never experienced. But it, that's why I like one thing we're talking about earlier, looking at global cooling. Because the damage function the economists are using, particularly Nordhaus, is simply y equals x squared. So you can have x being minus four rather than plus four. And therefore, he's going to say that the damage of a four degree fall in temperature would be about a 3.6% fall in GDP. Now, that's what I did in the OECD, showing those old maps. And of course, they're based on the knowledge we actually have of where the ice sheets got to. And at four degrees temperature, below pre-industrial levels. New York was below about half a kilometer of ice. Chicago was below a kilometer of ice. The whole of Canada was gone. And his prediction is that would cause a 3.6% fall in GDP. I'm sorry. That is just ridiculous. You cannot make that sort of extrapolation. You know, I think putting aside all of these models and predictions mm. and climate change and everything else, we do have a really screwy growth model. Oh, totally. Uh, like screwing. this, I mm. was walking to the studio today because I was thinking about this, mm. and I was just looking at all the people just passing me by, mm. and we generate so much waste. Mm. The fashion industry, all the clothing, we are a consumption-driven economy, and when I say we, I mean the globe. But there's only yeah. a small percentage of the planet that actually drives that consumption beltway. Yep. And I think we do it because the models we use don't price the externalities. The things that are most valuable, yeah. that are worth the most, the quality of the air, the water, mm. the climate, everything, and also things that are far out in the future. If you have children, even if you don't have children, mm. you care about humanity, you should care about, let's say, at the very least, your, your theoretical grandchildren. Yeah, yeah. Right? So like, none of that's priced in. Yeah. And because it's not priced in, the economy doesn't see it, so it doesn't value it. And so what do we do? We make trade-offs that we wouldn't normally make if they had a price attached to them. Yeah, yeah. So that's like a major shortcoming of our system. And whenever you challenge that, when I say you, I don't mean you specifically, mm -hmm. though I'm sure this happens to you. Whenever you challenge that, people immediately have a reaction, not people, not everyone, mm. but a lot of people think that you're attacking capitalism. Yeah, yeah. And that by attacking capitalism, you are somehow suggesting that we should create some alternative system that is socialistic or whatever. And I don't even know if people think that hard about it. I think it's just defensive. People a, are knee-jerk defensive about it. It's a visceral reaction which, which thinks you're attacking a social system that has clearly given enormous benefit to humanity over time. But what you're saying is this would be a great social system if the Earth was a scale of Jupiter. If we could continue, if there were new Newfoundlands, Newfoundlands, new Americas, yeah, Newfoundlands, that was all existed. There was tons of this space. We'd be fine. And in fact, a very conventional economist, William Bormol, wrote a very nice article about this decades ago called what he called Spaceship Earth. And he said, "We have an economics. We have a cowboy economics with this vast That's prairies." That's fascinating. Okay, and he said, "We live in a crowded economy." Oh wow. Okay, and what's sustainable in one is not sustainable in the other. Totally. So that in that point, you have to say. If we get to the crowded point, wow. then we can't have unbridled capitalism or unbridled anything. A socialist system would be just as bad. If you see what the social, what the Russians did to like, I've forgotten the name of the lake, but it's the deepest lake in the world. It's one of the many lakes was polluted by the Soviets as well. So it is just unbridled growth, which is the problem. And therefore you say, how do you control growth when you have a disaggregated system? It becomes something which you can't do just on the basis of individual behavior. Well, I mean, the Aboriginal lands of Australia, mm. the Americas, mm. these were a very fortuitous bounty that mm. the Europeans came upon. Mm. You know, where would the Europeans be if they hadn't discovered the rest of the world? Yeah. How long would they have been able to run that model? Well, they, right? I mean, yeah, we'd, we'd run it more slowly in many ways. I mean, slavery, when I look at what slavery is, slavery is a way of finding cheap, directable energy. You tell the slave to go and move something, the food the slave is meant to move, the slave can make that effort. So the slave economy was a major factor in pre-Civil War America. It was a major factor in Britain. 
until Britain abolished slavery. So they all harness this source of controllable energy for a long time. And then we discover coal. And not just discover coal, we realize you can use coal in steam engines and then we don't need the animal power anymore. We've got the power of the coal. But we don't realize we're burning an accumulated mass of previous organic matter into the atmosphere, which is where we start overlading with the carbon dioxide. And now we're in the situation where if we'd stopped doing this or started slowing down doing this 50 years ago, roughly when the limits to growth came out, we could still be within the bounds of the cowboy economy. There was a scenario in the limits to growth. There were, I think there were seven scenarios they played. And with one of them, we had population control, where we had increased efforts on moving across to green energy, more work on pollution sinks, and a range of other changes. Those policies together, the model said we could continue indefinitely, but we didn't. And what we've done is we've more than doubled population since that came out. We've more than doubled per capita energy use. So we've more than quadrupled the load we're putting on the biosphere. And that's where the breakdowns we're seeing are coming from. So weren't we like 2 million people on the planet back in the 70s? Somewhere? About 3, oh, 3 billion. Three. So we're about 7.5 billion mm -hmm. now. You know, this is a really tough thing because most people, what matters to them first mm. is themselves, mm. their family, and their mm. friends, right? Yep. Mm. That's true for me. I don't know if it's true for oh, you. Yeah. 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 And I don't trust our government or any other government mm. to be quite honest with you. Maybe the Norwegian government. I don't know the mm. I don't know the Norwegian government. Maybe there are governments out there that I could theoretically trust if I knew something about them. Mm. But I don't trust them enough to put all my eggs in that basket, right? What I think about is how can I protect myself and my family? Mm. I feel mm. like that's what most people yeah. think, right? And the trouble is your basket is affected by everybody else's basket. Yeah, exactly. Basket. And, and the argument would be yourself. you can't, exactly. And the argument no man be, is an island. Exactly, exactly. And there's also the other issue, which is that the people that are most in favor of climate change are, of course, people that are already rich, mm. right? Mm. Yep. People that, let's say, are trying to generate income. So what I'm trying to say is that this requires a very strong socialist response. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I mean, Socialist in the sense that we do it collectively. Absolutely. And yeah. it requires redistribution of capital. It requires mm. huge collective effort. I mean, you're talking about something analogous to the buildup for World War II. It is exactly that. That's right. my normal analogy is World War so II people, on so, steroids. So that, again, America, think of the, the sort of cultural economic model. This is a pioneer country, Yeah. right? It's very much about empowerment of the individual. The individual goes out. Mm. Let's leave aside the fact that that is a very sort of simplified model of, of reality, American, but also it's yeah, become history. much more difficult because of the lopsided wealth distribution, the the regulatory capture, all the, you know, we saw those ridiculous bailouts after 2008. Mm. But still, what it would require is all sorts of, let's say, people in the country to reorient dramatically the way that they think about or the way that they even go about engaging in the world. It's mm. such a dramatic rethinking. Yeah. You know what I mean? And on top of that, you need international cooperations. So I just don't see it happening. Neither do I. You know what I'm saying? Neither do I. So then the question is, what do we- What are the consequences? So you and I have talked a little bit about this, an eco-fascist model, mm. where a kind of eco-fascism would arise out of this environment from a minimal friction sort of pathway. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? Um, quite scary because I think, first of all, I agree that we will not make the political decisions necessary to reverse direction until it's obvious we should have reversed direction 20 or 30 years earlier. But like that's my Titanic model. You know, you see the iceberg, but you see it too late to change direction you're going to hit. So then the question is when you hit, what the hell is going to happen? And in that world, one of the decisions people will make is there are too many of us. This is basically the Treaty of Rome a little bit. Not exactly, but there were some, I might maybe, this is either I'm referencing a conspiracy theory or there was something in the Treaty of Rome, not the Treaty of Rome, sorry, the not Club the Treaty of Rome, of Rome the Club of Rome, not the Treaty of Rome, yeah. the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome included we had population control. Right, the Club of Rome. When the they Treaty did this, of Rome was the European yeah. Union. When they did the, <laughs> the seven scenarios, the only scenario that actually managed to mean a sustainable load on the biosphere over time included population control. So like I'm not saying population is the problem. It's the sole problem, but it is- But it would be a problem at a, at a higher temperature. Yeah, it's a problem now. We've gone beyond the carrying yeah. capacity of the planet. However you estimate it, 
we, are, we don't really know that though. We don't know it. We, we might feel well, it. It certainly a, feels that way in New York. Yeah. Well, there's what's called the human ecological footprint, which is an attempt to work out how much of the sustainable reproduction capability of the planet are we absorbing as a species. Now, it does include, I know there are plenty of climate skeptics will be listening to this, hello, but so it does include the carbon dioxide load as part of that measure of they call the human ecological footprint. But even if you take that out, and so you don't talk about the carbon dioxide load as part of the pressure we're putting on the planet, they are saying we are using about 80% of the complete renewable resources of the planet every year for our species alone. When you include the carbon footprint, it's 1.6 times. So Steve, I'm gonna move us to the overtime. For regular listeners, you know the drill. If you're new to the show or you haven't subscribed yet, Head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces or go into the description to this week's episode. I have a link where you can sign up to our audio file subscription and get access to this week's overtime or to the autodidact or super nerd tiers, which give you access to the transcripts and rundowns. This week, there is no rundown because Steve called me a few days ago or mm-hmm. emailed me a few days ago to tell me he'd be in town. And this is going to be an additional episode in addition to what we normally put out every week. So there's no rundown. But if you want to hear the overtime or get access to the transcript, again, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces and join us in our conversation. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded at Creative Media Design Studio in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.com. Dot io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.